Understanding sensory needs and their impact on anxiety. Brought to you by the Occupational Therapy Team in the Neurodevelopmental Service, Coventry. The aims of this session are to provide you with an overview of our senses and how we process them. We'll be then exploring how sensory difficulties can impact on a child's anxiety levels and look at the links between these two. And then we will spend uh, more time looking at um, different strategies that you can try to help with some of the difficulties with sensory and anxiety. So what is occupational therapy? Occupational therapy aims to enable a child or young person to become as independent as possible in their daily occupations and maximise their potential. And when we think about occupations for children or young people, um, the main areas for them are play and leisure, so activities they enjoy, learning to take care of themselves, that's indicated as self-care, and participating in school. So as OTs, we like to use a child's strengths and draw upon those to help them in some of the areas that they may find more difficult and use those to help to um, improve those areas of need um, and support them to become as independent as possible and to engage in things that they need to engage in like schoolwork, like taking care of themselves but also engaging in things that they want to, thinking about things they really enjoy because that's also a very much important part of a child's um, life. Here I'm going to now talk you through each of the senses. Um, now some of the senses you will know and be very aware of. Um, there's probably two on this, on this slide that you may not have heard about and you may not know all of the details. So what I would also suggest, because I'm only going to go through this in a little bit of detail, I would encourage you to go onto our website, which is cwrise.com, and look at the neurodevelopmental tab, and then go into resources, where you will find the supporting sensory difficulties presentation. Now within this presentation, each of the senses are gone through in great detail and give lots of explanations about how they impact on daily living um, and how we use them functionally as well. Um, so I would encourage you to look at that because I'm just going to be going through them very briefly here um, for the purposes of linking them then with anxiety and how, we, how they're very closely joined. Um, so looking at the slide here, on the left you have um, the senses that are termed the higher senses. Now these are the senses that we use in everyday situations to kind of know about where what's going on around us and all different things that we um, we are seeing and hearing and 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 sensing. Um, so you've got vision, which is about um, how we navigate our way around things, to see where things are, to know when something's perhaps a danger, to um, recognise um, how to avoid falling over something. So we use our vision very much and it's one of our most used senses. Um, the next one on the, on the list is the smell and that's also closely linked with taste. That's obviously very much an important sense is to when you're thinking about eating. Um, you also use smell to help you recognise when there's a danger perhaps, whether there's something's burning or a smell that's not normally there. Um, taste, um, we've got loads of taste buds with on our tongue so we can recognise different different tastes, uh, recognise when something's um, something that we like, something we don't like um, and it, in th those, those two senses um, we do often see quite a lot of difficulties with children with autism particularly um, with, with eating and those, th those two senses are ones that are um, factors there. Um, and the last one on this side is hearing um, so we're using that to kind of alert ourselves to knowing what's going on in the room when we're in a classroom when our name's being called um, sometimes it can be that we're quite overwhelmed by sounds um, so you're very highly uh, very sensitive to hearing everything going on around you. So like I said those are senses that you'd be very aware of in your day-to-day -day living. Um, on the right hand side these senses are termed the unconscious senses. Now you will know about the tactile so the touch sense. Um, I'm just going to go into some detail about this, the pathways related to this sense. 
So with the tactile sense, um, you've got the a discrimination pathway. Now that's the pathway that is, helps us to understand what things are. So we use our tactile system to recognise different objects, different textures, different shapes. Um, we use it so if we're going in a pencil case or into your bag to get something out you can use the tactile sense to recognize you know when it's a pencil or when there's a rubber or where your keys are um, that sense is very important to enable us to, to kind of do things quite quickly really in our day-to-day -day living um, and then the other pathway with the tactile sense is the um, protective pathway now this one relates to um, recognizing um, vibration, recognising um, light touch, um, knowing when something is, is painful um, or something's hot, the so temperatures or cold. Um, now this is very important to keep us safe so if you are touching, um, your child touches a hot pan, um, you know, if the part, that pathway is working well we know that we recoil our hand and we take it away to protect ourselves. If you're not recognising that something is, is hot then there's a real risk of getting seriously burned. Um, so th these pathways are very important um, to keep ourselves safe really and, and help us to navigate our way around. Um, but we do often see some difficulties with the tactile sense with children with autism. Um, and then the next one is the proprioceptive sense. Now this is about um, knowing where our body is in space. Um, so it's, it's that, like our internal body awareness knowing for example when you're putting your arm through um, into your jumper or into your coat um, you can do that because you without looking if you've got a good proprioceptive sense because you can kind of recognize and you know what your body is doing and you know what movements your muscles and joints are doing to know where it is in space and and able to coordinate that sort of move um, it, the proprioceptive sense also helps with knowing how much force is needed to do um, a task so, for example, with handwriting, um, if your child is, is pressing particularly hard, um, they're needing a lot more feedback to their brain to know what they're doing and to know what they're writing. Um, so we do often see quite a lot of children having difficulties in this area. Um, also with a task like how hard to push a door to shut it um, or lifting an object off something you know how much force you need to do you know whether you need to be do it heavy or it's, whether it's light um, and then the last um, sense on this slide is the vestibular sense now this is about balance um, so it's sometimes termed as like our inner spirit level so it helps us to know where our body is and helps to know where our head is in space um, also helps us with the direction of movement to know where we're, whether we're moving forwards or backwards, whether you need to kind of whether you're bending over. Um, it helps understand gravity as well. Um, so some children really um, are fearful of, of kind of movement that that their feet when like for example their feet are coming off the ground, and they're not they kind of that fear and anxiety kicks in because they're not knowing where their body is. Their vestibular sense is not working properly. Um, but also some children really seek this sense, they seek that movement, so spinning, liking to be kind of upside down and really liking that deep intense vestibular input. Um, so it can be one, one of two ways really with that sense as well. Um, so so that, they, they, that goes through all of the senses um, and to give you a bit of an idea of then what we're going to be touching on when we're looking at these strategies and relating them back to these senses. So what is sensory processing? Sensory processing is about us taking all the information in that is going on around us and being able to work out what information is what you need to be um, alert to. So we're taking sensory information in all day, every day, throughout the night as well. Um, so this information is constantly coming in. So we need to find ways of working out which parts of information are important. Um, and, and it helps us be able to respond to situations in the most appropriate way. So for example, as you're sat there now listening to this presentation, you might be aware of sounds around you, sounds perhaps outside your window, a car driving past, 
or sounds within the home. Um, you might be aware of where you're sitting, um, aware of the clothes that you're wearing, if they're comfortable, or if you've got like, like maybe a, an itchy um, tag that's in there, and that's you know distracted by that. Um, when you're when you're listening to this presentation, you're able to work out which parts are the important part so you know you're you're trying to listen to this information and try and filter out some of that information that is going on around you but it's not important for you in this activity um, it helps um, us organizing ourselves um, and works works out how we kind of respond to different situations um, but we actually only use about five percent of this sensory information and we're able to ignore um, or filter out the other 95%. So it's it's quite a big process. So if you're having difficulties with processing sensory information, there are there are different problems that can occur. So what can go wrong? We see that children with autism and or ADHD, um, these sorts of difficulties quite frequently. So with regards to difficulties with sensory processing, these difficulties tend to occur either when you filter out more than 95% of the sensory information. So if, you're do if this is happening, then you are not really aware of what's going on around you. You may appear quite withdrawn um, and you may take a lot of effort to kind of do any sorts of tasks. Um, or alternatively it might be that the child the child is letting in more than five percent of the information and this therefore will affect their arousal levels so if more information is coming in then they are very easily distracted they um, struggle to filter out information and they may appear to be quite anxious because they are on that high alert level all the time so some of the common difficulties that we see, you'll see are listed on um, the slide here. So going through these, there's that feeling of sensory overload. So there is just so much information coming in and you don't know, they don't know what to do. Um, and they really struggle to concentrate on any sorts of tasks. Um, it may um, lead to avoiding certain situations and withdrawing. Um, so maybe those children that perhaps are out of school. Um, they may be engaging in self-stimulating activities to cut out the stimuli. So this might be a way of them coping. So you might see somebody that is um, spinning a lot or they may be um, flicking objects um, as a way of, of sort of calming and self-regulating. Um, you might see the fight or flight response. Now, if you've done any work on anxiety before, you'll be aware of this concept. Now, this is when um, you, the child or anybody is responding to a situation that is causing anxiety um, and they may fight so may kind of get, get angry and, and, um, and kind of want to, to fight out. Um, they may um, run away so that's flight, um, you know escape from the situation. In addition to this there's also the freeze um, element where some children will just be completely stationary and not be able to know what to do and, and kind of be uh, in that freeze mode um, so this is something that we see quite common with children with sensory overload difficulties um, and they um, respond in this anxiety response which is, is a natural response but the way that um, things have evolved in our current society um, we find that people are very often this fight or flight um, response um, to everyday situations which is quite tiring for the body um, and and for the brain and it like emotionally um, and and finally on, on this list is um, that it can really impact on learning new skills so for our children being at school where they're constantly having to learn something new this can be a really really um, significant struggle for them um, so it's very important to be able to, to identify if there are sensory difficulties that are leading to this heightened anxiety um, because it will affect them on in their learning and doing something new. With these difficulties in mind I'm now going to talk to you about the calm alert state um, and use the image that's on this slide to help explain how throughout the day everybody will go between the different states of arousal. Um, 
and actually sensory modulation facilitates a calm alert state and this helps us then to function to a, a ma our maximised ability. Um, we've used here the images of Winnie the Pooh, Tigger and Eeyore to help you to remember and recognise these different states. So I'll start off with um, the over aroused state which is Tigger. So Tigger is the kind of um, character um, that is overexcited, maybe into everything, touching lots of things, jumping around, difficulty staying still. Um, there also might be that child that is really aware of everything going on around them and hearing all of the things and um, easily distracted by what's going on. Um, so they're the ones that are you know, always on the go um, and you might sort of describe them as that human dynamo as well. Um, and then you've got the um, calm alert window which is in the centre here where, where we describe um, Winnie the Pooh as being that character. Um, so this one is where you are able to work out which sensory information is important. You're able to listen, to communicate effectively, to um, maintain your concentration on tasks. So if you're in school, sitting down at a table, listening to the teacher, completing the work. Um, you're able to just be be engaged in an activity in an effective way. Um, it's important to highlight here though that with children with autism it is um, a shorter window so the window of being calm and alert might be for shorter periods of time so um, there needs to be lots more sensory strategies throughout their day in order to support them to have more of those calm alert windows. Um, and then finally on this slide you've got the under aroused state which is um, here described as Eeyore. Um, so this is the kind of child that is um, maybe takes a lot of effort to get going, um, not really aware of things around them, not recognising their name being said, um, appearing disinterested in activities. They might just not be aware of all the things that are going on around them and they need lots more input to kind of wake themselves up to get up into that calm alert window. Um, and what we need to kind of highlight here is to think about you as an adult as well as your child that you will be fluctuating between these calm alert states um, and so will your child and you may not be in that calm alert window at the same time so you might be um, busy doing lots of things distracted by lots of things going along around you your child might be right down the bottom under aroused and needing lots of input to get going but they don't recognise what's going on around them. It's, it's going to take quite a lot of effort to perhaps get you both into that calm alert window to communicate because you're on different ends of the spectrum. Um, so it might be worth considering the things that you do to wake yourself up. So, you know, to get yourself going, perhaps um, particularly in the morning, you might be that under aroused state. Um, what things do you do to wake yourself up? Is it that you have music on in the morning, um, you have a loud alarm go off to, to get you going? Do you have a drink of coffee or tea um, or do you have a cold drink? Um, what do you do to help bring yourself down into that window? So when you're over aroused, lots of things going on around you, how do you calm yourself down? Do you, do you find yourself um, wanting to um, have a walk? Are you finding yourself wanting to um, maybe chew some chewing gum or um, a chew on the end of your pencil to kind of calm yourself down again. So there are various things that you'll do without perhaps even knowing that you're doing them to help you to concentrate. Um, for children with autism and ADHD we need to think about putting some of those activities into their day to help them to get into that calm alert window. So these senses of arousal are also very closely linked with um, self-regulation and emotional regulation. So if we are able to identify the type of arousal stage the young person is in, then we can help them to uh, learn how to self-regulate. So having a look at that slide with your child to think out loud what, your, what they think they do in each of those states of arousal and what they look like for them because they'll be different to perhaps what other, their, other, their other children might look like or what you look like. So do it specifically for them and then 
you, we, we will look at how you can then incorporate activities to help them to get into that calm alert window but for them to have activities they know they can do. Um, it's also really important to look behind the behaviour that your child is doing and, and see whether there is something that they're trying to communicate. Um, we often find with children with autism they struggle with being able to communicate their needs effectively. Now sometimes it can come out with some behaviour that is, is, is negative or not, not useful. Um, so we need to help thinking, help to think about what is, are they trying to actually tell us with whatever their the situation is. Um, and you know they may need some help with dampening down sensory input. You know what things can you put into the environment, adaptations, equipment, um, strategies to help them to feel less overwhelmed with the sensory environment around them. Um, and also. Are there, um, is there a need for direct increase in their sensory stimulation? So if they're really under aroused, what things can you help to put into their environment to help them feel more alert and able to engage in an activity? So it's, it's a be, playing a bit of a detective really, um, together with your child to work out what works for them. It's also less threatening if you do it with them, if you think about your own self-regulation, what things you do throughout your day. Um, and it kind of helps to normalise it as well with your child to, to kind of consider what things they can do and put into their day to help them to self-regulate. So why is um, being able to self-regulate important for managing um, our anxiety levels as well as our sensory overload? Um, if you think about your arousal levels, if, if they are too high, then it is more than likely to trigger your stress response. Now our stress response is something that happens without our control really. So it's a, it's a natural response that everybody has um, and it's a way of us being able to stay alert to things around us and protect us. Um, however, in current society, um, people's stress levels are higher than they typically were and our responses are to everyday situations. Um, for children with autism and or ADHD, um, their anxiety baseline is probably going to be a little bit higher than um, other people's because they are on the high alert quite a lot of the time. Um, and if this anxiety goes beyond that um, into, a, into a level where they are not able to communicate um, not able to cope in situations then it can be very very difficult for them and and that state of anxiety can make people feel more sensitive more aware of what's going on and find it really difficult to cope with daily tasks and doing things that we we have to do so it's important to to kind of recognize that and be aware of the impact on anxiety so that we can try and do something about it and try and give some strategies and build up awareness for everyone around them. It's important to consider the environment when thinking about your child and how they cope in different situations. Have a think now about um, how the home environment helps support or, or not so support at times your child. So think about is there a space in the home that they find is calming, which might be your, their bedroom. Um, think about what it's like when it comes to eating. Um, do you eat in the kitchen? Do you eat in, in the lounge? Do you eat in the dining room? Are there lots of distractions going on at that time? Um, or if you're eating in the kitchen, are there lots of smells of the cooking that's been that's gone on beforehand? Um, how do they impact your child at different times? Um, and then consider how the school environment can be quite a different place to the home. Within the school, um, there's lots of noise, there's lots of people, there's lots of distractions. Um, they're having to move around and navigate their way around different different times of the day. Um, thinking about the playground, that's a very busy environment. Do you, does your child feel overwhelmed in that state? Um, and and then consider: Are there simple changes that you could put in place that might support your child to better engage in activity or feel calm and relaxed? Um, so 
thinking about visually are there lots of things around that um, are overwhelming so can you think about reducing the amount of things on a wall can you reduce the um, noises that are, that are in, your, in your home um, and, and see how those making some simple changes like that can have quite a positive effect on your child's engagement um, and, and thinking about some of the self-care tasks we ask our children to do. So they have to go into a bathroom where there may be lots of different smells. Um, there may be um, quite nice, calming, place, uh, relaxing things for them. But also there may be some things that are really quite overwhelming. So, you know, thinking about how that does impact your child can help you to think differently about the situation and make some other considerations. Um, and it's also really important to have a conversation with your child because although you may think that there's certain things that are not so good for them in the home environment um, or the school environment, there may be things that they think actually that's a really good thing to have in place. Can we have some more of that or that something particular that isn't good and they'd ask for that to be removed. So again, opening that dialogue between the two of you to, to work out what things and changes you could put in place. So we're now going to consider how having difficulties with um, sensory processing and anxiety can have a functional impact on a child. Now on this slide here you'll see a number of um, activities that your child may have difficulties in um, and how they're impacting on them functionally in their activities of daily living, so their ADLs. Um, so I'll just go through each of these to give you an idea and a, a kind of a bit more background on why some of those difficulties might be occurring. So first of all, um, I'll look at how it can affect a child with organising themselves. So if a child is um, over aroused by all the sensory stimulus coming into them, um, particularly when they're in the school environment, they may really struggle with organising themselves to navigate their way around, organising what tools they would need for the, for the class they're doing um, and planning what they need to be doing. Um, and they may be looking like they're extremely anxious, they may be withdrawing from situations. So it can really have an impact on, on sort of getting themselves organised for a day and to do a task. Um, it might also impact on them engaging in their learning when they're at school. Um, so with concentrating, being able to sit still, if they're so overwhelmed by the, the tactile input, so by what they're wearing and where they're sitting and feeling um, what they're doing, that they'll be fidgeting in their chair, rocking back and forth. They may be distracted by looking out of the window. So then their ability to actually focus on a task in hand is going to be really, really hard for them. Um, can also have quite an impact on um, sleep um, if they're, they're struggling to, to switch off from all the things going on around them actually having the ability to um, feel calm, regulated to fall asleep is quite substantially impaired um, so that sort of child would really need some strategies to help them to switch their brain off to kind of get ready into that sleep mode to prepare for falling asleep and feeling um, like they can they can actually do that. Um, and if if there are, are difficulties with sleep, then we know that this then does impact on the child the next day how they're going to function in their day to day living the next day. Um, can also affect simple tasks like washing and dressing. Um, so being able to tolerate having a bath or a shower, washing themselves with a flannel being able to tolerate um, brushing their teeth, um, being able to coordinate themselves with getting dressed um, and knowing what they're doing for that task. Um, and you know, if, if a child's having difficulties like that and they're um, not, get, not able to get themselves out of school to school in time, then that, that, that kind of impacts on their day further on and their, their anxiety levels are naturally going to be raised. Um, uh, they might find you might find your child is is not involved in activities. They're avoiding things. Uh, maybe quite isolated um, because they're not able to cope in those different situations. So going out to do an activity like cubs or um, an activity they enjoy, they might have the the motivation, desire to do it, but the whole concept of being in that environment, which is 
overstimulating um, and, and too much for them, then they may avoid going to those things in the first place. Um, and, uh, you know, we naturally avoid things that we're afraid or anxious of. So um, it, it's something that we know that we need to kind of try and give them some strategies to be able to engage in things they want to do. Um, we sometimes see difficulties with toileting, so the um, whole process of going to the toilet involves lots of smells, um, there's lots of tactile um, sensations that occur during this process. Um, a child may have difficulties in recognising that they need to go to the toilet and that can then be quite anxiety provoking in itself. Um, so we'll go through some strategies um, to help recognise those sensations because we do know that's, a, that's quite a common difficulty for children with autism. Um, and also sort of looking at the fact we talked about the environment earlier and you know going into a bathroom is not always the most pleasant thing to do particularly thinking about the school toilets um, so you know if for anybody going into those can be overwhelming if a child is particularly sensitive they may avoid going to the toilet which again would have difficulties that could lead into some physical difficulties so we do need to try and identify what is the problem that is causing them to to not access um, those those like through the bathrooms at school and other things changes that we can make like simply looking at are there disabled access toilets that your child is able to use would that something that the school would consider putting in place for them um, and the last one on this slide is um, having a limited diet um, if a child is particularly sensitive to different textures um, different smells trying something new we know that's also difficult with children with autism um, then that can really impact on how, what their diet is and, and whether they're willing to try a variety of, of foods um, and I think that's something that we see time and time again. Um, now this list isn't exhaustive, this is just some examples of how having difficulties with sensory and anxiety can impact them on a day to day basis. You might identify with some of these for your child, you may be thinking there are very uh, other very more important areas of need that you need to think about. But hopefully the strategies that we'll go through um, later on in this presentation, you'll be able to apply to your particular area of need that you see as being the most important. We will now move on to think more about the um, strategies that we can put in place to help support our young people. Um, so first of all, I just want to talk about um, natural modulators, so natural activities um, and different senses that we use to help us to regulate and modulate our sensory input. So um, we talked earlier about the vestibular, tactile and proprioceptive systems and gave you a brief overview of what they were. Here I want to just explain that actually the three of those senses together are um, natural calmers and organisers for the body. So we use these systems to help us moderate our arousal levels in, every, in very discrete and individual ways. So for example, you might be sat there now with a pen in your hand, um, you may be inadvertently chewing on the end of it, or you might be tapping your foot, rubbing your forehead, um, rocking slightly on your chair, um, spinning a bit if you're on a chair that moves. Um, these are really natural things that we do but they're actually activating the vestibular, tactile and the proprioceptive sense. Um, so you know next time you kind of perhaps see your child uh, doing an act, doing something that might be rocking around on their chair or um, flicking um, something with their fingers or um, tapping their feet. Perhaps just think about are they trying to regulate themselves? Are they trying to naturally calm themselves and make themselves be able to concentrate on the task in hand? Um, so you know that sort of fiddling, fidgeting, doodling, they're, they're natural ways of us trying to help concentrate that we do day in day out. I'm now going to look through the different calming strategies that we often describe and go through with um, children and young people. Now these strategies are thinking about trying to support the child to come down from the over alert state, so that tigger state, to try and get them into that Winnie the Pooh just right state. 
So these strategies are about dampening down and helping to calm their body down when they're over aroused and into and, and finding that they're easily distracted or quite anxious. So first of all, we've got on this list um, about deep pressure and massage. Now we go through, we talk about this because we find that deep pressure and um, massage that's quite firm can be quite regulating for the central nervous system. Now we also know that these this type of input activates the proprioceptive and the tactile systems, which as I talked about a minute ago, they are natural modulators. So together they can be really calming and regulating. We will go through in the slide after this as well about strategies that you, the young person can do themselves for calming that we're using deep pressure. But I'm going to talk about here how you as a parent can help support your child with applying some level of deep pressure and massage. So thinking about if you see your child looking over aroused, quite anxious, overstimulated by the environment, if you gently put your hands on your child's shoulders and apply some degree of deep pressure down through their shoulders, just put pressing fairly firmly so that they're getting that sense of where their body is in space and that can be quite calming. We know that children often do quite like those sort of deep um, bear hugs as well which can be quite um, firm and they can have the same impact. If you're thinking about doing firm massage we talk about um, and suggest you doing that on the hands or on the arms. You can do this to them but you can also help teach them how to do it and you might find that they're using them themselves independently. The next one on the list is, is thinking about creating a quiet space. Now we have lots of children we see that sometimes um, do already have this sort of thing in place so whether it be some kind of um, pop-up tent within their bedroom or an area that has either towels or blankets that kind of cover an area so they've got a little space that is a safe space to be. Um, within that environment they could have some calming distraction toys as well um, whether it be sort of vibration toys, um, perhaps thinking about lights or anything that is going to give them a, a sense of relaxation. It could be some gentle music that, that's played within that, that environment. These sorts of environments can be encouraged because we, we, talk, we encourage you to think about getting your child to consider when they would use that space to help calm them. But initially you'll probably have to be that person that encourages them and helps them recognise when they're feeling overwhelmed that they can use that space to help them to calm. Um, and, and perhaps including in that applying some heavy deep pressure exercises while they're in that calm quiet space as well and then they'll find that their central nervous system is calming down and potentially their anxiety will be as well. Um, the next one on the list is about minimising visual distractions where possible. So thinking about the home environment, what things are there around that are quite distracting when you're asking your child to perhaps have dinner, um, have breakfast or try potentially doing their homework. Are there lots of things that are going to be impacting them on a visual point of view? So is there a television on that they're, they're, they're distracted by? Are there people coming and going out of the room they're in? Have they got are there windows where there's people walking past all the time? So can you do some things like potentially having blinds coming down on the window so there's those that visual distraction from outside is less at the times when you're wanting them to attend to do something. Um, can you turn off the television? Can you limit the people coming in and out of the room? Some, some sort of things to consider because visually it's very easy to be quite distracted and, and that, that can really impact on, on how a child behaves and, and what they're able to do. Um, when you're thinking about the school environment as well, this can sometimes be a bit more tricky because you're, you don't have control over that as much. But you, what you do have control of is, is making sure that um, the teachers and the SENCO that are working with your child, making sure that they are quite aware of how, if your child is influenced by visual distractions, can they consider where they are placed within the classroom? So can they be closer to the front? Can they be placed away from a window? Um, so they're not haven't got those distractions so readily 
there. Uh, another option is to consider having like a, um, a cardboard area around them at the table so that they don't have the distractions to the side and in front. They're, they're going to be more encouraged to then be able to concentrate because there's not that visual distraction there. Also with minimising auditory distractions as well. So this can be quite important at times like when it's time to do homework as well or, or having dinner. So have you got the radio on? Are there lots of people talking at the same time? Can you reduce that noise? If you're not, if that's not possible, then can you consider things like ear defenders or small um, earplugs? that they can have um, during these times because you may find an increase in productivity if you're able to reduce that auditory stimulation and distractions that are coming in. Um, and again, making sure that the school are very aware of those difficulties. So can they also implement those strategies? And schools generally are very good at, at providing those sorts of equipment and supporting the child to use them where appropriate. Now the next one on the list here is about therapy ball activities. Now some of you might be aware of um, the large therapy balls that are often used, that are in gyms, etc. So these are very useful pieces of equipment to have at home. You can get the large um, round therapy ball balls in different sizes, but also you can get peanut balls, which are um, really good for the children that have quite poor core stability and maybe would roll off just an ordinary big ball. The peanut ball is, is in the shape of a peanut um, nut so it, there's a dip, dip in the middle where your child can easily roll over and, and be safe and more secure when they're doing the activities. We will provide um, extra information on therapy ball activities for calming strategies um, with this presentation for you. But just as a very brief description, there are there are two very good things to be doing with, with therapy ball. So we encourage the rolling over a therapy ball, so where their stomach is on the ball and their arms are um, over the ball with their hands on the floor. If you have your hand gently on the um, base of their back and then you can roll them, rock them backwards and forwards where their legs are off the floor and their arms are out straight with their hands on the floor and that gentle movement which is um, called linear movement is forwards and backwards is really regulating for the central nervous system and something else that you can do with a therapy ball is to help with with really good with it helping to calm is to have your child to lie on the floor either on their back or their front whichever they're more comfortable doing and then to use the therapy ball to you as the parent you roll it over your child starting perhaps at the feet and you roll it over them but you gently apply a bit of pressure and you're very much guided by your child so ask them whether it's firm enough or whether they'd like some more pressure and if they don't you know want a little bit less then you release the pressure off but if you roll this over their body being careful not to press too hard on the chest area and obviously not over the head then you can really apply that deep pressure which is um, which we talked about earlier which is activating that tactile and proprioceptive sense which is calming and regulating and we have really good success results about with using this sort of activity um, and you do it for a few minutes depending on what your child can tolerate but it's a really good one also to use to help with a child to fall asleep and get into that mindset and calming sen sensation to then fall asleep. So that's a really good piece of equipment but like I say we'll add some more information with the presentation. Now I've, I've kind of gone through the next one to some degree talking about linear movements where I talked about rolling over the therapy ball. You can also get this, this sort of linear movement if you are on a swing so going backwards and forwards on a swing is calming and regulating. Um, you can also get it when you are walking or riding a bike. Now obviously they might be more getting more input as well when riding a bike but the fundamentals are that you're in a, going in a straight line and you're getting that input which is that regulation which we talked about being so important. Now the other one um, we've got on the list is about using a heavy backpack. Now you might notice your child likes to have a few things in their backpack. They might like to put stones in their pocket 
um, and actually that's a really good thing to be doing because having a bit more weight on your body can be giving you that input that helps you to feel grounded so if your child um, walks to school really encourage them to wear their backpack and make sure there's a like a water bottle in there and a couple of books and that's a bit heavier gives a bit more input to their body which helps them to feel calm and also walking with a backpack is going to be doubly good because that's a linear motion which is regulating um, and then the next one is talking about heavy work activities now these are um, are about giving your child tasks to do that are quite purposeful they can be both at home and at school that are going to activate the muscles and joints so some examples I, we often give are to move the shopping from the car into the house carrying bags or moving the washing from out, so out of the wash basket into the washing machine and sort of carrying something that's, that's a bit heavy and for example at school it could be that they, they are tasked with the job of, of lifting the books from the back of the room to the front or carrying some um, paperwork from the office back to the classroom anything that's that's going to be a bit heavy is going to be activating the muscles and joints which is really calming for you so it's it's that principle and you've got to think about some practical activities that are meaningful to both the child and to you to add into his into their day um, so again we will add some um, heavy work activities along with this presentation which you can have a look at and think about picking some of those activities to use to help regulate and bring your child down from that over aroused state. Now, the last one on this list is thinking about um, bedtime and going to sleep. Now, I'm sure you've, you've, you're quite aware of, of technology being used a lot by children but that the light that is on technology is overstimulating for the brain so we do suggest that if you're thinking your child is going to bed at eight o'clock is to think about switching off all, all technology at least an hour before so at seven o'clock um, so that your brain the child's brain can start to switch off from that light that, that is, that is um, emitted by tablets and phones so that they, your brain can start to think it's about time to go to bed because the more exposure they have to the technology light then it thinks it's, it's daytime and it's awake so it's really difficult for the brain to then switch off so if you take that away for at least an hour before bedtime it's going to give your child the best opportunity to be able to calm themselves their whole body down to think about going to sleep and be successful at that, that task because it is so important to be able to have a good night's sleep to then have a positive day and engagement in the activities the next day so it's something really important to consider and add that into the bedtime routine is to take take away all technology at least an hour before bed on this slide I'm just going to now go through some of the calming strategies and exercises that your child can do to them themselves that are activating the muscles and joints in different parts of their body um, as I've talked about earlier this is the proprioceptive system and tactile system that will be activated which is um, quite intense calming to the body the central nervous system so I'll just go through each of them that, uh, on, on this slide and explain how to do them. So the first one at the top left of the screen is where the child is placing their hands together, palms facing each other, and you push your hands really hard together, holding this position for about 10 seconds and doing two or three blocks of 10 seconds hold. When you do this, you and you release it after about 10 seconds, you will notice that the muscles that are going up your arm and your shoulders will feel that sense of calm when you are releasing the pressure. This is quite calming to the whole central nervous system which can help with thinking um, so that you can be able to communicate in a better way and feel more in control of your body reactions that are occurring if you're feeling anxious. The next image on the slide is where the child is holding their hands together. One hand is upturned and one is facing down and then you grip the fingers together and then you try and pull your hands apart so again this is, is activating the muscles and joints in the arms up to the shoulders which 
once you hold it for about 10 seconds and then release it you'll get that sense of feeling of calm going through your body as you're doing it um, I would encourage your child to do this a few times this is quite discreet that you can do it you know they can hold their hands underneath the table do it when they're standing in a line at school or outside in the playground these are really good simple strategies that I would really encourage your child to be using the next one on the image so the top row at the right hand side this is where the child is holding um, themselves so they're give, giving themselves a bit of a bear hug themselves so wrapping their arms around themselves pushing their hands in to squeeze their body this is kind of quite intense pressure um, if you your child particularly likes the bear hugs from yourself this is quite a good one to encourage your child to do as well um, the next one on the bottom row so looking at the bottom left you see there's a child sitting on a chair their hands are holding the base of the chair where they're sitting so if you if you have your hands on the chair and then they're tr effectively trying to lift their body off of the chair by pushing down pushing their hands quite um, hard onto the chair and then lifting their body so the bottom slightly comes off of the chair and you hold that position <coughs> for a few minutes a few seconds and you'll feel that's quite intense so again it's, it's activating the muscles in your arm and and probably going down your back as well as you're holding up quite a bit of your body weight but if you do this a few times within the chair if they're sitting in class this is quite um, intense input that they will be getting that can be quite calming and and relaxing if they're feeling that anxiety about some work that they're doing the next one, um, the middle image on the bottom row, is where there's somebody pushing against the wall with their hands flat against the wall. Their elbows are slightly bent. You don't want to lock the elbows, so don't have them really straight because that will damage your elbows. You want to have it slightly bent. Their feet are flat on the floor, about um, the half a metre away from the wall, but their feet need to be flat, their legs straight, and they're pushing their body weight into the wall as if they're trying to push down the wall. That um, again would be going down the back and the arms, quite intense pressure through the body. You could do that a few times. Um, you could also have your back to the wall, so they're trying to push with their back, um, feet flat on the floor again, but they're pushing the wall with their back. Or equally, they could also, if they're standing against a wall to the side, the shoulder and their arm is pushing on the wall. That's again quite discreet. No one's necessarily going to notice but they're going to get that input through their body that can help calm themselves. The last one on this image is where we are. We um, encourage the children to put their hands on their head and they are going to push their, their head down. That's going to push into their shoulders, push down through their back, down through their body. And as if they're trying to encourage them to really push quite hard and push their uh, that feeling that's going down through their whole body now this one is particularly intense but is really quite effective they'll feel that that sensation within their face as well um, it's, it's quite a, a good strategy to have and use at any point of the day um, you could just do that for a few seconds and then have a release and do it again so doing it in little, in little bursts is quite effective so there's some really good ones. You could use those images. They could draw their own little ones um, that they can have on their, as a visual cue, they could have them on their door, in their bedroom or on their fridge somewhere. That's a really good reminder of strategies that they can do and regularly throughout their day so that they're getting that input continually and not just at one point. Regular intervals of this sort of input can be really valuable sensory input to help manage anxiety as well. Here I'm going to now talk about ways in which you can increase arousal levels. So these are for the children that are perhaps anxious and worried about things that are going on, but they may appear to be withdrawn and really struggling to get going. So they may be in that eel state, the under aroused state. So equally, this is, this is something we do need to look at as well with thinking about ways to manage anxiety. So we want to find ways to help them to be more alert and more able to engage in an activity and do things they enjoy. So I will just go through some of the strategies and give some more examples of ways you can do this. So the first one on this list is about therapy ball activities. 
Now this is similar activities that I talked about before, to put like rolling over the ball and activities that are going to be stimulating also include sitting on a ball where you, the child, as long as their feet are touching the floor and flat on the floor, they bounce on the on the therapy ball to be help to kind of wake them up effectively, like to make them more alert. Um, when they're rolling over the ball, doing stuff that's a bit more active, so a bit more movement and maybe a little bit faster than what we talked about when we were um, rolling over it calmly in a linear motion, doing activities that involve them moving an object from one side to another, so they're crossing their midline, so going from the right to the left. If they've got like a box of balls that they want to put into another box on the other side, they could pick one up while they're lying over the ball with their hands flat and their legs are off the floor. They move forward to collect a ball, move it to another side and then roll backwards again. Go, Continue to repeat that same motion. That can be quite a, a, a way of alerting and help work on core strength as well, which is quite important for doing other activities. Um, I will. We will send you out information on therapy ball activities, which goes through this in a bit more detail for you to look at with the presentation as well. The next um, item here on this slide is talking about crunchy snacks. So when you're ch when you actually eat something that takes a bit more effort, so something that is quite crunchy, like a, a raw carrot or an apple or licorice anything where your muscles in your um, mouth are going to have to work harder to eat that's also activating because it's quite intense input the child will be getting this can help make them feel more alert so thinking about crunchy snacks in the morning what they're eating um, anything that's going to require more effort is really good and help alert your child um, the next one is talking about drinking cold water now cold water is quite alerting, we, we all know when you drink something cold you feel that sensation, you might feel it going down your throat, into it down, down through um, your chest, it, you know you can feel that motion so that is, is alerting your body to something that's quite a different temperature to what the body temperature is. When we talk to parents um, about drinking cold water we also encourage drinking through a straw because that's again going to use more effort than just drinking a cup as you would and just drink that way. So if you've got a drinking bottle that has a straw in it where your child's having to suck and, and get that water up and it's cold, that's going to be doubly effective. So that's a good strategy to have in place. Um, you could also put the, the drink bottle in the fridge for a few hours to make it really nice and cold if you're wanting to help wake them up in the morning. Um, the next one is about regular movement breaks and changes position. So if you think about if you're feeling quite lethargic, quite tired and needing a lot to get going, if you're in, so actually moving off of the sofa or out of your bed is going to take quite a lot of effort. So if you encourage that regular movement and, and changing of positions, it can help motivate you and help and change your where your brain's thinking to help you to move and be able to engage in another activity whether it be just simply getting up and going and having a wash to get dressed um, and making sure these breaks carry on throughout the day don't just think oh they're able to concentrate and do stuff in the morning so I don't need to do breaks until the afternoon that's not going to be helpful because you might find there's more outbursts in the afternoon because they haven't been able to have those movements earlier on so when you're talking with schools um, talk to them about the fact they need to have those regular breaks and make them purposeful as well. So if your child does say half an hour, 45 minutes of work, make sure that then there's an activity that's, that's requiring movement. So whether it's that they move something from the front of the classroom to the back, um, move something from their desk down to the front where the teacher is, that sort of movement is helping to alert their minds and kind of think, okay, I need to get a little bit of movement helps me to then concentrate and be alert on what the next activity is going to be. Um, also with changing positions, having those things like the sit fit cushions underneath them helps them have that constant movement but it's not distracting to other people. So that simple sort of air cushion that sits on the seat that they then sit on then gives them that movement and that helps to keep their alert levels a little bit higher than they would be ordinarily if they just sat on a plain chair. So that's a sit fit cushion which you can look into and lots of schools do have them in stock that they use with children anyway. 
The next suggestion there is about using visual timetables. So these are really good. I know lots of children use them. I'm sure you're very aware of them being useful. So whether the visual timetable is about what the school day looks like and having that in school. It could also be about um, what the morning routine is, what things do they need to do. So they might need to have breakfast before they get to go and get dressed. So thinking about what works for your child, but having some sort of visual timetable, whether it is with visual images or whether it be with just writing, but colourful writing that they have, they've been part of doing as well. Um, there's also timers, a really good auditory cues of when to stop. Also helps with alerting them that an activity is finished um, or when an activity is about to start. Those timers can be really good cues for them. Um, and any and any other sorts of visual cues. So having the the clo their clothes laid out for them, so they visually know what they need to do. Having a system within the bathroom where they have their toothbrush, toothpaste, and maybe a flannel laid out, so they know what things they need to do. Those sort of gentle reminders helps also to support independence. Um, obviously, it depends on what age your child is, but thinking what's appropriate for a six-year-old to do um, or what a, an eight-year-old is, 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 is uh, able to do. But thinking of encouraging a little bit of independence and responsibility, if appropriate, for them to take on board as well. Those sorts of things can really help increase arousal because they're having to think about what they're doing and they're not just having everything done for them. Um, the next one is about thinking about re reward charts. These are really good um, strategies, particularly for younger children, to help motivate them so they know what what they're going to be achieving as a result of something they do them doing something. Now we do encourage these reward charts not just to be about money or food. Thinking about what other things that helps motivate your child. It might be spending time with um, time with you as a parent doing a play in a board game or doing an activity outside if there's little things that they could they like try and incorporate those in as opposed to just thinking that they're going to be achieving money or screen time or food are there other things that you can incorporate into that to motivate your child um, and the last one on there is talking about swings are quite um, increase they're good activities to do to help increase arousal so particularly those swings that are in parks and that you can go on um, where there there's the rotary motion so they're going around in a circle that can be quite alerting and arousing for a child to help get them into that just right state so thinking about other activities where they can swing or go just generally going on a swing can be kind of arousing to help bring their body up to think I need to be doing this. Um, some other things just to think about increasing arousal is, 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 is about building up your child's awareness of what's happening in their body as well. So this isn't written on there but I just want to explain that some children or everybody when when you feel anxious and worried about something they may withdraw and then not then not be doing stuff so they need to kind of find ways to help alert them. But what we'd encourage you to do is to help them to recognise what's going on. So are they finding that they are clenching their fists? Are they is their heart beating faster? Um, are their are their thoughts all muddled and can't they communicate very well because their their minds are just thinking about the anxiety and they're not able to function in a way that would allow them to communicate effectively. So if you think about spending some time with your child to draw a picture of a body, just an outline and just um, identify what's going on in their body when they're feeling those anxiety feelings. So thinking the kind of general things are an oh, increased heartbeat, clenched fists, feeling tense, um, muddled thoughts, maybe tense feeling around your, your face where you're clenching your feet, uh, teeth together. It might be that they um, are tapping their feet. Um, feeling that butterfly feeling in their tummy, feeling they might need to go to the toilet. These are those some of those examples of, of early warning signs for anxiety. So it's really useful to have a conversation with your child to see whether they recognise what's going on in their body, but also what you might see. So you might see the things like them chewing their nails um, or chewing on a pen all the time. 
those sorts of behaviours and act actions they're doing are really important to help your child to recognise when they are starting to feel that anxiety and when they can then do some of these sensory activities to help them to manage that arousal and help them feel in that to return to that calm alert window. So we will go through some other um, strategies from a, um, an anxiety point of view as well but that's really good to link with the sensory um, strategies which is, is, is really useful to do with your child. So in addition to the sensory strategies that we've gone through earlier in this presentation I just want to talk about some um, different strategies that you can use in a, that combines both cognitive strategies as well as sensory. So the first one here on this slide is about making an emotional toolbox. So this can be a physical box that the child can decorate as they want so it makes it more personal to them. And inside this box, so it could just be like an old shoe box that's decorated, that sort of size, in there they can keep their things that they find relaxing and that are going to help them. So it can be things like a stress ball or a fidget toy that they play with that they, they know is kind of calming to them. It can be something like therapy. Now therapy is a type of putty that has different degrees of resistance and depending on the age of your child you would look at something that's appropriate so they have different strengths so medium, medium soft, medium strong um, and then and then a firm one. It depend, depending on their age you get the correct one and then they use that to kind of have in their hands and squeeze and there's going to be that bit of resistance which is going to be activating the tactile and proprioceptive sense because they're going to be squeezing hard and working through calming themselves and that kind of motion can be quite good similar to like a stress ball. Um, you've also got a, a consideration to think about different textures of materials that they might find relaxing so some children might really like silk or velvet um, or something that is relaxing or reminds them of something that's positive. Having those in there just to kind of feel and, and kind of have with them can be calming. Thinking about some visual distractions as well, it could be something like a little egg timer that has um, coloured liquid in it that, that when you turn it up and the water gradually flows through, they can be quite visually distracting and calming. You can think about different smells as well, so maybe a nice smelling hand cream that can be in the box, so they can use that to put place over their hands. So they'll be getting the nice smell that's, that's kind of calming but also with putting it on their hands they could be giving themselves a little hand massage which again we talked about earlier which can be really calming to the central nervous system. There's also the, the for the from a cognitive point of view thinking about their thinking if they've got particular worries that keep going over in their mind it might be good to have a little um, pad in there and a pen where they can write down some of those thoughts that are going through their head and they can't seem to kind of shift and, and kind of get out of their minds by writing it down can be a way of, of gaining a bit of control because it's kind of writing it down having it there and trying to rationalize whether it's it's fact you know whether that information they've written down there's evidence to support that being true or whether it can be challenged to help them think a bit more calmly about the situation um, and help them to manage it better. Uh, one other thing you could also think about putting in there could be some music, a CD that we, they know that's relaxing and they can put that on. So they, so they know they've got this box of tools that they can go to when they're feeling anxious because they can't really think straight when they're feeling anxious. So if they've got a physical box they can go to and they know there's things in there that can be calming to them, they can access them more readily than just having to think at that point Oh, what can I do? How can I find something that's going to help me manage this situation? So I would encourage you to do that with your child in a state when they are calm and you are able to spend some time together making it up where you've got to decorate the box and think about all the things you might put in there. Now it might be also important to consider that you will this will change over time. So there might be points where they think that doesn't really work anymore think again and think what else could I put in there in its place and, and make some alterations to it that's okay and it's important to reflect with your child about how that might evolve as they get older and things change. 
Now the next strategy that's written on this slide is about making some sort of worry box. So similar vein of when we were talked about writing down their worries and their thoughts. If you make a box with your child, and they can have one at home and they could have one at school, again get them to decorate it themselves and then have um, paper that is readily available to them and you would encourage your child to write down if there are thoughts and it could be thoughts they've written down from their emotional toolbox they can then put it into the worry box and they're kind of putting it aside for a bit so they might not be ready to talk about it they might not have the, the kind of space in their minds to think logically about it just yet but they've written it down then find a time when it's appropriate to kind of open up that box and have a conversation about what worries that there are in there. Now I would say it's important not to do this perhaps just before they go to bed. That's not going to be a good way of, of trying to, to solve those worries because it's going to perhaps have an impact on them not being able to fall asleep. So I would encourage you to think about a time of the day, perhaps mid-morning when you can do this or when they've come home from school or on a weekend that you can have a chance to go through those worries and try to problem solve them together and think about what strategies you could they could put in place or ways to kind of resolve those issues that they're having. And equally, if they've got one at school, encouraging them to have a time at least once a week within the school week that they can go to somebody that they trust, whether this be their teacher, a teaching assistant or a SENCO that they feel comfortable to talk to take that worry box and talk about the worries that they've been able to put in there and see if those school-based worries can be resolved in that context because it's quite difficult for you as parents to think about all those worries they're having at school and you're a little bit out of the, the situation so it's more difficult for you to try and come to some solutions whereas if there's one at home and one at school there can be that collaboration and try and working together and resolving some of those problems at school can have a positive impact on things not on not following them over into being at home and then them struggling to be able to express what they're actually thinking. In addition to these strategies, we also um, have done a number of times with young people is to talk about making their own volcano. Because when you think about worry, worry is that build up of those different emotions, different feelings, different thoughts and things that are going on for that young person. They're building up and slowly there might be that kind of point where it gets to the top and there's a bit of an explosion which may come out as, as anger, as, a, as an aggression, um, out, aggressive outburst um, or like an explosion of shouting and, and that sort of situation because they don't know, haven't been able to um, deal with those emotions that are underneath and that could be about worry and anxiety. So by way of making a volcano, and it's quite a simple process, um, where you make some salt dough and make it around the uh, an old um, plastic bottle and making a volcano let it dry then you can paint it and decorate as they want and the process of actually erupting it but throughout the whole process you're talking about how this might be symbolizing and represent, representing how anxiety can build up in in you and feel that that you can't deal with that situation it kind of can explode in a way that you don't have control over it's a really good visual way of a child being able to understand and remember the principles maybe you've talked to your child about but it helps them visualize what what it actually means so we will include um, details on how to make a volcano at home and hopefully you could do that with your child and and help them to kind of grasp what anxiety means to them and help them remember some of those strategies and when they should be thinking about using some of the strategies so it doesn't get too big and explode. So that, that's some other strategies we, we think really important to go through and, and consider trying to do with your child at home and equally you could kind of talk to school about whether they could incorporate some of those strategies there as well. It may also be useful to consider different relaxation strategies to try and help you develop for your child. So this can be following relaxation scripts online and different relaxation music to help calm. So there's also um, some progressive muscle relaxation which is very good for helping 
your child to feel that sense of relaxation so it's tensing and relaxing different muscle groups throughout the body and feeling that sensation and, and kind of trying to really focus on it we will include some relaxation scripts that you can try accessing um, for your child as well to help them to to do it you could always record yourself doing the, the relaxation and then they can do use it at any point that they wish to do so you don't always have to be present they are just general strategies that are really worthwhile considering with your child We've also included a number of different apps that might be useful to consider using with your child. So first of all there's the Don't Panic app which is a Coventry and Warwickshire Partnership Trust app that we've developed where you can get support for different situations and it goes through like anxiety and helps you understand anxiety and talks you through ways to manage it differently. There's also SAM, which is a self-help for anxiety management, and that's about helping you to track your anxiety and support you with identifying different strategies so you can log information on there. There's the Virtual Hope Box. Now, this is a really good one for children, particularly with autism, because there's lots of visual information on there. So there is a visual relaxation for tense and, mus tense and relaxed muscles which goes through, there's a voice talking you through each of the stages but there's also the visual side of showing you the child where which parts of the body are tensing and relaxing so it's, it's a good aid to support them and there's also part of that also is the deep, deep breathing exercise where there is a, a voice telling you when to breathe in and then when to breathe out but there's also a visual showing you how long you're breathing in for and then it goes back up again for when you breathe out so it's a, another good way of helping to support your child to do that deep breathing exercise and to calm their body down which helps target some of those early warning signs we spoke about earlier to help feel more control of a situation there are also some distraction activities um, and there's a, a a diary where you can write down what you what you can do in different situations so there's a really good um, all-round app that we we do suggest people to access to help with anxiety in particular another app um, we often talk about is calm this provides timed guided meditation and that could be av available on your um, browser or smartphone so you can actually find ways of, of gaining that relaxation that we talked about earlier as well. So there's, there's lots of different apps out there. These are just ones that we have used and we've advised parents to access and children as well. There's also some useful websites to perhaps look at. There's the um, NHS Choices website, the Coventry and Warwickshire Mind, where there's a wealth of information of different strategies and local resources as well. There's Anxiety UK, um, the Young Minds website also goes through a catalogue of strategies and advice on there, as well as the National Autistic Society. So here, this final slide goes through the pathway of the intervention and what is going to happen now that you've had this information and this um, guidance on strategies to manage sensory and anxiety. So we encourage you now to go away for between 8 to 12 weeks to try out these strategies and these recommendations made here. We also encourage you within this time to also look at our website which is www.cwrise.com where you can find all the information on the different um, presentations you can watch on supporting sensory difficulties, um, managing um, emotional regulation as well as talking and listening there's lots of information that would encourage you to look through all of those as well if you feel still after these 8 to 12 weeks that you need some more advice and specific information and guidance around a difficulty that's still occurring um, even though you have tried the strategies that we've gone through then you can contact our team on the telephone number which is 02476 961226 and you can ask to be booked into a telephone consultation with one of our occupational therapists 
If we don't have any contact though within the 12 weeks, um, then you will be discharged from occupational therapy and we will assume all is well. If you do contact us, then you'll be booked into a consultation with one of us and a summary of this consultation will be sent out to you, to the referrer, to the GP and to the school if you agree. Then you go away and you try the strategies that we've gone through over the phone and you could potentially be discharged from occupational therapy at this point. If however there is still further need and we have a consultation then we'll consider what further occupational therapy input is required so, and, and a further appointment will be arranged with, in agreement with yourself with then the potential following this to then be discharged from occupational therapy. So if there are any questions that you do have in the meantime in these 12 weeks where you're trying out these strategies, we would strongly advise you to contact us and um, ask for some further advice and we'd be happy to help. But we really hope that you're able to use the strategies and advice given here in this presentation and put them into good use for yourself with your child at home and within school.